point out that we have two very special guests with us here today who will be sharing some words. Um, Chief McIsaac, um, he started as police chief in January 2020. Yes, yes 2020. Uh, and then some things happened right after that, uh, like COVID, um, the country dealing with the murder of George Floyd and, and other things like that at the start of your, your police chiefship. Um, and recently, uh, town manager Patrice Garvin said McIsaac performed beyond ex ex expectation at an exemplary level, using the strengths that he has, given his personality and years of experience with the force as the assistant chief. We are so glad to be here to speak with us today. <laughs> and also we have with us uh, Leslie uh, Talmadge, clinical social work therapist, um, and she's based in Belmont. She's a member at First UU. Um, and she's also part of the LGBTQ plus Alliance and the Belmont Against Racism. And I'm probably leaving out a few more things. Yes, I am. Okay. No, okay. <laughs> and she has uh, uh, some wonderful words that she says, challenge and recovery are possible. They're always possible. And within your work, she says, I promise to provide a safe, trusting environment where you will be seen, uh, understood, and accepted as you are. And we look to hear more from you and sharing your words. But first, uh, we invite Chief McIsaac. I invite you to stand over here. And the rest of us can be seated. And Chief DeStefano, we're so glad you're here too. Yes. <laughs> as as uh, Pastor Eric said, my name is James McIsaac. I'm the Belmont Police Chief. I have a, a written speech here, but I'm not too crazy about it. So we're gonna, we're gonna bounce around a little bit. Um, I'd like to thank the pa Pastor Eric and the members of the Payson Park Church today for the appreciation services. The last time I spoke at this event was in 2020, two years ago, um, at, I'm sorry, 2021. And there was a great deal of negativity towards law enforcement at that time throughout the country. It personally means a lot to me that um, Eric has kept this going. At that time, um, it was challenging for everybody, naturally. And there were times when I was asked to attend meetings and things and not wear my uniform. Um, because of what it meant to people at that time, which is fully understandable. Um, I also spoke at that time about, um, you know, when, unfortunately, when you have uh, things like the murder of George Floyd, it does present opportunity, and it presented great opportunities for the police department uh, to improve. Uh, and I'm speaking sp specifically of the Belmont Police Department, but statewide police uh, reform was passed. And believe it or not, that was something that a lot of chiefs in Massachusetts were behind. Um, we weren't too crazy with the way it was implemented, but because we're still actually working out some of those wrinkles. But, you know, that was something that, that I supported. And the other plus that came out of this was, um, was what we call co-responders. Some departments were ahead of the curve where they had social workers actually embedded with their police departments working with them. Um, it was not an opportunity, it was not an option for Belmont to do that because we simply couldn't afford to hire a social worker. But um, the opportunities presented itself through police reform and from social pressure, that there was a lot of state grant money, there was a lot of federal grant money, and we were able to take advantage of a grant and in partnership with the mental health agency uh, in, in, in Framingham, we were able to hire a co-responder uh, that's embedded with our offices um, we have one twice a week now, and we're going to have one full time. We just hide we'll, us in partnership with uh, the advocates. That's the group in, in Framingham that we work with. Hired this person. So this social worker will be working with the Bama Police Department five days a week um, in, in a police car, going to calls. And uh, that, that means so much to us because uh, as we were talking before uh, with the fire chief, we, we you know, Police, when we go to a call, a mental health call, we have we have two options. We either arrest the person for maybe being disorderly if we can't get the situation under control, or the fire department takes them to the hospital. And it taxes the system in a couple of ways, and it taxes the individual in, in, in an extremely negative way. So our goal with this social worker program is it's called a diversion program. The social worker tries to divert somebody from going to the emergency room and 
obviously from going to jail. And it's been successful. Um, and it's actually been so successful that, that, that we probably at some place down the road will probably have two full-time social workers working in our department. Watertown uh, currently has two. And so that's kind of the things we've been doing at the police department um, to, to, in response to what's going on. We were heavy on de-escalation, we're heavy on training, implicit bias training. But you know, since the, the, the George Floyd and the pandemic as it begins to recede, and I'm gonna speak about uh, some other challenges that we face, and it's not uh, solely to the police department. Uh, the Chief DeStefano will tell you he has a similar problem, and that is hiring and retaining new employees. Um, currently, right now, the way the situation is in Belmont is we have seven vacancies, and we're going to have three more vacancies in 2023. And so what we do is we there's a statewide uh, list uh, exam given every year, and um, it's given in the springtime. And residents from Belmont that want to be a police officer in Belmont get uh, residential preference in that community, in the community where they reside. So if if you've got if you live in Belmont and you got a 70 on the exam, but you you're a resident of Belmont, and somebody from Cambridge got a hundred on the exam, but they're a resident of Cambridge, um, the 70, the Belmont resident with the score of 70 would be ahead of the the Belmont. Uh, I love the Cambridge resident. So just to give you some background on this, when I took this exam in um, probably the early 90s, I think 91 or 90 was the first time I took the, the civil service police exam. My score put me 32 on the list. That meant there was 31 Belmont residents ahead of me on the list. So eventually um, I ended up getting hired and it took me uh, until 1999 to get hired. Uh, or, or by taking that exam. So currently what happens, we have seven vacancies. I called for a list. We got a list, that list only had three Belmont names on. Only three people from Belmont uh, had taken the exam to be police officers in Belmont. So then we open it up to statewide. Um, anybody who put Belmont down as a community or any uh, veterans or disabled veterans. So 71 people got a card to come in to try to be a Belmont police officer. Of that 71 people, we only have two candidates that are going in uh, to the process for background. So this is a challenge for us, you know, and it's a challenge for the fire department. It's a challenge for our dispatch. It's complicated. There's a lot of reasons for that. And there's a lot of different reasons that we could, I won't get into, but I see one of the big things and I, I see it in uh, some of our younger officers that are, uh, you know, we, we talk about they, they like to have their time off. They like to go on a lot of vacations and things, which is fine. Um, but when I, whenever I talk to young people, I always talk to them about being significant in the lives of others. And I talk to my officers about that. I say, you know, when you're, when you're successful in life, when you have a nice car, when you have a nice house or you have a great job, you know, when you pass on, that success ends. When you're significant in a positive way in the lives of others, that significance can last for generations. You know, we all have teachers. I have teachers that said one thing to me once and it basically changed my whole life. So I try to stress and emphasize to the new people that, that this gives you the opportunity to be significant like social work does, like teachers, all the, 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 uh, the employment that uh, Pastor Eric mentioned in the beginning, firefighters, uh, coaches, nurses, doctors, those kinds of things allow you to be significant and they allow your significance to last generation. So I'm hoping that as, you know, I think as public safety leaders, myself, Chief DeStefano and other chiefs throughout the state, that we're going to talk about that more and getting back into service. I don't know if the activism, you know, a lot of people are activists now. I don't know if they, the activism is taking them away from service, the call for service, but we really need people to, to serve in these, these positions. And um, moving on, you know, you know what, what has also been appealing to me and, and you know, this, the last two years have showed it. You, you go to work, you, before, before I was a police officer, I worked in sales till I was 32 years of age. It was a great job, it was a great career and everything, but it wasn't what I wanted. And this, this, when you're a police officer, you're a firefighter or an EMT, every day is something different. Every month is something different. And you never know what it is and you adapt. It gives you the opportunity to meet new people and, um, you know, changes yourself as an individual. I've changed. 
Um, I talk about this all the time of my work with, with the community here in, in Belmont with Belmont Against Racism, some of the other groups we have, the Human Rights Commission. I mean, it, it's been such an educational experience for me um, that I can't say enough about the job. And of course, I'm the chief. And if one of my patrol officers said, yeah, chief, you don't have to do all that other stuff. But it's uh, anyways, we want we want to get back to, to telling people how great the, the, the profession is. And um, I can assure you, uh, Belmont, Watertown, Waltham, um, we have excellent public safety in, the, in these communities, excellent relationships. The chiefs, Watertown's going to have a new chief sometime soon. They have an acting chief and Captain, Captain Rocker, but I know they work well with their fire. We work great together, Chief DiStefano and I. Um, you know, Chief DiStefano uh, has done a lot um, with our schools to beginning. So, you know, when you, when you have a, a, a a community like Belmont and you kind of go along, you kind of go along with the way things have already always been done. And then, you know, Chief DeStefano's come in and, and he's, he and I have begun collaborating on uh, active response to hostile events. And um, he's, he's nudged the school along. So we're gonna, we're looking forward to having a great working relationship and, and serving the community of Belmont uh, the best way we know how. But, you know, we have, um, we have outstanding police, fire, EMTs, and uh, dispatches in, in all of these communities that are around. We have great relationships. There's nearly no, everybody kind of checks their egos at the doors. And um, events like this, they, they mean a lot just to get the recognition uh, for what we do uh, year in and year out, and day in and day out. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chief, and inviting forward, uh, Leslie. Thank you so much for joining us today. Good morning. I'm Leslie Talmadge, and my family and I live in Belmont down the road, and I'm a member of the Unitarian Universalist Church in town, as Pastor Eric mentioned. Over the years, I've worked as a social worker in schools and community mental health centers in Brookline, Shirley Air, Boston, Newton, and California, formerly. Sadly, I recently opened a private therapy practice in Belmont and online, of course, but the timing for starting to practice, sadly, could not be better. It's not sad that I opened a practice. It's sad that the timing so Germain for this. So as you know, the pandemic has led to a significant rise in major depression and anxiety disorders in the order of more than 100 million additional cases globally, according to a study in The Lancet last year. So it's not surprising that during a global health crisis, people have experienced increased psychological distress, as the chief mentioned. That said, I consider myself very lucky after working as a high school English teacher and journalist, I went to back to grad school in my late 40s. My mother had just died and her death left me with existential questions along the lines of what Chief McIsaac mentioned. What makes for a meaningful or in his words, significant life? Or in the words of professors who established the design program at Stanford, what makes a life come together in which who you are, what you believe, and what you do all line up together. My mother's life was a great example of just that. She taught Tai Chi, a Chinese martial art, to older adults at a community college for more than 30 years. Her teaching and her students gave her her greatest sense of joy and fulfillment. Her example encouraged me to take a risk and go back to school at the young age of 40 something. <laughs> now, more than 10 years later, I get to use my strengths curiosity and compassion to be with people, witness their struggles and ask questions aimed to help them recognize patterns that may have held them back and to make changes that will, I hope, help them lead lives more in alignment with their values. I'd like to share my experience briefly working with one of my most memorable clients, a 22 year old Mexican woman with German Jewish heritage whom I'll call Natasha. Natasha had a history of complex trauma and at the time an undiagnosed mood disorder. She called the center where I was working reporting that she felt isolated, suicidal, and at times mad. 
When I first met Natasha, her strengths were notable. She was motivated to change her life. She was smart, curious, thoughtful, artistic, resourceful, resilient. She had a wide range of interests, including film, literature, writing, drawing, and French. Even during her lowest mood, she would drag herself to the gym every day. It was my privilege to work with Natasha for nearly a year. Early on, our work focused on her safety, providing her with a sense of stability, building up her social support network, and helping her to tolerate distress. I asked her questions about what she had to live for, what triggered her feelings of despair, and things she could do when she felt depressed or suicidal. We also discussed how she had managed as well as she had. She never missed a therapy session, for example. Over time, I tried to help Natasha change her narrative to help her see that she wasn't in fact a child dependent on the whims of her untrustworthy parents, but rather a competent adult with resources and people she could call on for help. Slowly, Natasha's mood improved and we were able to address some of her other goals, including graduating from college, going to grad school, finding a career she felt passionate about. In our final months together, Natasha was accepted to a small college she received a scholarship and she found a job at a restaurant, which she liked. By and large, Natasha reported feeling optimistic and happy. She felt, she said she felt emotionally and physically healthy for the first time in her life. In her words, she felt like herself again. In one of our last sessions, she told me, I really like who I am. That's I think what I most enjoy about my work helping people become ca compassionate allies to themselves, but also improving, helping them to improve their well-being. Outside of my work, as Pastor Eric mentioned, I serve as co-chair of the Belmont LGBTQ Plus Alliance, which is part of Belmont Against Racism, and which strives to make Belmont a more inclusive, welcoming community for all people, regardless of their sexual, gender, or racial and ethnic identities. On that note, I want to express gratitude to, to Chief McIsaac for his support of our community and our alliance. Specifically, he wrote and implemented a new transgender policy for the police and fire departments in town. And I wanna extend my thanks to Chief DeStefano as well, the fire department, who for the past two years has participated in our Belmont Pride Parade and has been very supportive as well. And finally, I want to thank Pastor Eric and all of you members of Peace and Park Church for overwhelmingly voting to become an open and affirming congregation. I consider myself so lucky to be um, a member of this community and I thank you all so much for inviting us here today. Thank you.